Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the WCP webinar number six. Myself, Krishna, from WCP Research Foundation, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar. So, uh, Miss Sweety Sam has completed her master's MSc from Gujarat University, and she has done her master's thesis as an intern at WCP Research Lab. She has worked on feeding habit of sloth bear in Central Indian landscape under the guidance of Dr. Nishit Taraya and Dr. Prachi Thati. Uh, now I'll hand over to the uh, Sweetie. Mm -hmm. Um, Sweetie, you ready? Yeah. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm ready. Uh, so it's my audio audible. I'm audible yes. to you all. I yes. my PPT visible to you all. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you, Krishna, for this uh, introduction. So yeah. So this was my MSc dissertation that I did under the guidance of Dr. Nishitharaya and co guidance of Dr. Prachi Thati. So today I'll be presenting on diet composition and feeding ecology of sloth bear, that is Mellersis ursinus in the Central Indian landscape. Now before moving on to the next slide, let me start with why diet composition or why do we look into the feeding ecology of any animal as such? It's because what an animal eats is the fundamental aspect of its biology. So to study the diet composition of food habit of an animal, that is what, how, when, or where it eats or where it obtains its food, is important to study the ecology of an animal and its management. Bears of the world. The bear family Ursidae it contains a total of eight pair species in the world, which are distributed all over the world, except in Australia and Africa. So the eight pair species are polar bear, the American black bear, Andean bear, the sloth bear, the giant panda, the Asiatic black bear, the brown bear, and the sun bear. Now, among these eight pair species, only Polar bear is aquatic, whereas all the other bear species, they inhabit the forest. Now, out of this eight space bear species, sun bear is the smallest bear species, which weighs about 27 to 100 kgs, whereas polar bear is the largest bear species, which is about 150 to 800 kgs. Now, as a day, it comes under the order carnivora, but except the largely carnivorous polar bear, all the other bear species are omnivores, that is, they feed on uh, plant materials, insects, fishes, and mammals. Bears of India. India possesses four of the eight bear species in the world, that is, it has Asiatic black bear, sloth bear, brown bear, and the sun bear. Now, we'll be concentrating more on the sloth bears, that is what my topic is about. So sloth bear, they are tropical and subtropical in distribution and endemic to the Indian subcontinent. That is, they are found in India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. Now sloth bear. So the taxonomic name of sloth bear is Melissus ursinus. Now first, the sloth bear was named as Bradypus ursinus by a European zoologist named George Shaw in 1791. Bradypus ursinus means bear like sloth like bear. Like, so when he first saw sloth bear, he related it to the tree sloth because few of the features were related to the tree sloth. But in 1800s, it, uh, it was then reclassified as a bear and now which is known as the Melissus ursinus that is sloth bear. Now they are listed in Appendix 1 of Site and are protected under the Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. 
it is also considered vulnerable under the red list category. Now, when you see a bear, how do you know it is a sloth bear? How do you identify the sloth bear? So I'm going to just give you a few of the main features, how you identify a sloth bear. So sloth bear, it usually has a long black shaggy hair. As you can see in this picture, along with a U or V marking on its chest. You can also see that in the picture. Now, it also has long hair around its neck, and which is about around 15 centimeters, and it kind of forms a ruff. Now, sloth bear are the only bears that have hairs on its ears. So these are few of the features that you can identify when you go into, uh, into the wild, you can identify whether it's a sloth bear or not. Now, moving on, food and feeding of sloth bear. So I'll be telling you a few features, how these features have the sloth bear for the easy ingestion process. So first is this, the sloth bear, it has a whitish gray muscle. And this muscle is the only part of the body where it has short hairs, whereas all the other parts, it has long hair on its body. And here, as you can see, it has extremely mobile lips. You can see that it's spouting right now, but yeah, it's extremely well lips and it has a very long tongue. Along with that, as you can see in this picture here, the upper middle two incisors are missing in sloth bear. Now, they also have a hollow bony palate and can voluntarily close their nostrils. Now, why this feature helps the sloth bear to feed? So, when a sloth bear comes across uh, ant mount or ant mount or a termite mount, what it does is it uses its sharp claws to break the nest, blows into it to remove the dust particles from it, and then extends it, its tongue into it and then sucks. So while sucking, they get or they feed on the ants and termites. So because of the missing of the upper middle two incisors, the extremely mobile lips, and the whole bony palate at the ingestion process or the feeding is very easy. Now, I have also said that they can voluntarily close their nostrils. So, how does the closing of the nostrils, voluntarily close their nostrils help for feeding? Why is it necessary for them? So, as you know, ants and termites are not going to be able to eat right? No. So, there may be some aggressive ants and termites. So, they may go into its uh, into the bear's nostrils and take them or bite the sloth bear. So for this, uh, the sloth bear can voluntarily close their nostrils so it won't go inside its nose. So this is the food and feeding of sloth bear. Now, as you can see here, the sloth bears, they are usually solitary mammal, except while raising the young ones. So as you can see here, there are two baby bears hitching a ride on a mama bear. So sloth bear are the only bear which show parental care by carrying the young ones on their back. So why does it do that? Why do sloth bears carry the young one on their back? Because traveling this way protects the cubs from predators as the mother does not have to worry about whether the cubs are being able to keep up with her. So this is a very good thing and bears, from all eight bears, only sloth bear is the one which shows parental care. Now, moving on to the goal and objectives of my study. My goal was to understand the food and feeding ecology of sloth bear in Central Indian landscape during different climatic conditions. And the objectives were to document diet composition and variation of sloth bear in hot and cold season, to document the percent of plant and animal matter in the diet of sloth bear through scat analysis, and the last was to document the food preference of sloth bear in the study area. So what the bear preferred in the study area that is in central India, what it preferred to eat. Now first, uh, about 85% of the global sloth bear population is occurring in India alone. And as you can see in this picture, most of the sloth bear population is concentrated in Central India. Hence my study site, Central India. 
Now my work, it was needed as a part of a project by NCBS Bangalore done by my co-guide Dr. Prachi Khatte on human footprints differentially impacts the genetic connectivity of four wide ranging mammals in a fragmented area. So my study area, it lies between the Aravalli and the Vindhya and the Sadhgura regions and is spread across three states, that is Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh. Now the present study has been carried out in 12, 12 different tiger reserves of Central India as the map is shown here. Now few of these are Achanakmar, Palghat, Penna, Panch, uh, Pench, sorry, Panna and Panch Tiger Reserve. So this uh, is the tabular form with flat, long area and state-wise distribution of the 12 tiger reserves that I have shown in the previous slide. So a uh, total of two, 321 samples were collected of which 167 samples were from summer and 154 samples were from winter. Now, moving on to methodology. So the first step is scat collection. In scat collection, which is done in the field. And here under that, identification, collection and preservation. So identification. So when you go into a field and you come across a scat, how do you know whether the scat is a slot bear or not? It's not such a, a great hassle to identify a slot bear scat. It's actually pretty, pretty easy. So the slot bear scat, it contains, it is, we can identify by its shape, size, and the foot degrees. It contains wholly of the exoskeletons of ants, termites, and fruit remnants such as seeds and peelings. Voila, your scat sample is of slot bear. Now second, collection. So the scat samples were collected, right? So some collection details are necessary. So we'll look into the location, date and time is to be mentioned. So that is the collection of the scat samples. Then the preservation. The scat samples were collect, uh, the scat samples which were collected in a 30 ml wide mouth bottle containing 100% alcohol for preservation. Then the second step is scat analysis, which is done in the lab. Here, segregation of the sample takes place. So what do we segregate here? The scat samples are segregated into plant matter and animal matter. Then scat composition. After this, we will look into the person, plant and animal matter. Then identification of the plant and animal matter. So we have segregated the samples into plant matter, the scats which contain plant matter, and the stats which contain the animal matter, then the identification of what are the plant matters present in those samples and what are the animal matters present in those samples, and we, we will look into the seasonal vari variation. That is, in which season, what food item it prefers to eat. So, the results and discussion. Through this road, we will look into the first one, which is person plant matter, Person, animal matter, and both, that is animal and plant matter in scat samples. Second one, we look into the multiple diet component in a single scat. Third, frequency of occurrence and person relative frequency. Fourth, we look into the identification of food items found in scat. Fifth, the seasonal variation in food items. And sixth, the seasonal food availability. So let's look into it one by one. Yes, this graph here shows the person plant matter, person animal matter, and person plant and animal matter in summer and winter season. So as you can see here, the person plant matter is more in summer, that is about 19% than it is in winter, which is about 5.60%. Whereas the person animal matter, it's more in winter, that is about 35.82% than it is in summer, which is about 28.66%. Now those samples in which we found both plant matter and animal matter. So here, the person plant and animal matter is more in winter, that is about 6.54% than it is in summer, which is about 4.36%. 
Now, these two graphs depicts or this two chart depicts the different components found in the sloth pest cat in summer and winter season. Now, this dietary composition reveals that the frequency of occurrence of animal matter is more in both the seasons. As you can see in summer, the animal matter is about 55%, whereas the plant matter is about 37 And in winter, the animal matter is about 75%, and uh, the plant matter is about 12%. Now, while comparing these both two, we know by comparing this both two, uh, we me, can continue. Yes, sir. Uh, can you speak loudly or adjust your mic again? Um, am I audible to you all? Is it okay? Okay. So, uh, I'll start again from this slide. So, this two chart depicts the different components found in the sloth pest cat in summer and winter season. So, this dietary composition reveals that the uh, frequency of occurrence of animal matter is more in summer, is more in both the seasons, that is, in summer and winter, as you can see. It's about 55% animal matter in summer and 37% plant matter. Whereas in winter, it's about 75% animal matter and 12% plant matter in winter. Now for both the person plant and animal matter, while we compare this two, it's more in winter than in summer. Yes. So while comparing these charts to the previous studies that is done in North India, South India, and West India, we come to conclude that sloth pests eat both plant matter and animal matter with variation. It's probably because of the food availability during the season, during different seasons, and in the different geographic areas. Yes, so this uh, graph here shows the multiple diet component in a single scat sample. So those scat samples in which only one diet component were present or the occurrence of only one diet component is there is about 67.174%. Whereas the scat samples where the occurrence of two diet component is present is about 29.906%. Whereas the scat samples in which or where the occurrence of three diet components are present is about 5.919%. So from this you can see sloth pairs usually generally just eat one diet uh, in a day. Means it just eats one of the food items. But rarely, we feast So they use they eat three kinds of food items. So that which is about 5.909%, that is the occurrence of three diet component. Yeah, this is the tabular form that shows the frequency of occurrence and percent relative frequency of the food items in summer and winter season. Now the highlighted one shown here is the animal matter, that is ants, honeybee, termites, bugs and beetles. Now from these, uh, as we can see, the frequency of occurrence of ants and termites are highest in both the season, that is in summer as well as in winter, the frequency of occurrence of ants and termites is more. And while we compare between these two, that is in summer and winter, the frequency of occurrence of animal matter is more in winter than in summer. But the winter may bowl of animal matters yada khate hai compared to in summer. Now, kyun khate hai, why they eat animal matter more? I'm going to discuss this uh, in the next slides. So, this graph here depicts the frequency of occurrence and percent relative frequency of different food items in the sloth pest cat, and which is in summer. So, we have looked into the animal matter that they eat. The animal matter make which was the highest in summer and which was the highest in winter. Here we will look into the plant matter which was highest in summer. So in summer, uh, Edelman ficus and Edelman nose were the highest consumed. Whereas in winter, the Zygifus species and the Lantana camera were consumed the highest in winter season. 
Now this is only about the plant matter which was consumed. Now this is the tableau form representing the food preference by sloth bear in the study area in summer and winter season. So in summer, the sloth bear preferred to eat agar marmalos and Casea fistula, Cordia dichotoma, Diospirus melanoxylon, Ficus, Bvax or honeybee, Matuca indica, Cedrigium cumini, termites and Sisyphus species. Whereas in winter, they prefer to eat agar marmalos, ants, bugs and beetles, Capris sapialia, Casea fistula, Ficus, Bvax or honeybee, Lantana camera, termites, tubers, and Zygifer species. Now, as you can see here, the ants, uh, ants, bugs, and beetles, that is the animal matter, were consumed more in winter season. And I have also shown you in the previous slides that in winter, the consumption of animal matter were more or highest than compared to summer season. So why is that? Why do sloth bears consume animal matter more in winter by not in summer? So for that, let me first tell you a bit about the reproductive biology of sloth bear. So the mating system of bears varies from species to species, obviously. But what about sloth bear? The sloth bear the mating usually occurs during the summer or spring season, but the development of the fertilized egg does not occur until fall. It's because of the delayed implantation, but after that, the fertilized egg gets developed and the baby is born, or the sloth bear gives birth to the baby bear in winter. So that means it mates during summer that is between May and July. Because of the delayed implantation, it give, gives birth in winter season that is between November to January. And there is about five to seven months of gestation period. So you have to underline an, in, an inverted part and double line underline the winter season. They give birth to their young ones in winter season. So our question was, why is not best consume more animal matter in winter? Right. It's because the consumption of animal matter or that is ants, bugs, beetles and termites is more or there is a demand in uh, consumption of animal matter because of the protein rich demand. It's because of the lactating period of females because after giving birth, they, they need to uh, provide food for the young ones so it should be protein rich and protein we get from animal matters the ants and termites work speeders hence there is an increase or demand of consumption or increase in consumption of animal matter in winter season than it is in summer season so this is the food calendar that i made which shows the seasonal availability of the food plants of sloth bear in the study area. So why a food calendar? Why do we need a food calendar? How does it help us? So this food calendar helps the forest manager to know which plants to be planted and which to be replanted and which plant is to be protected. As you can see here, Casea fistula, Capris sapiara, and land in a camera. Now such plants should be protected and be planted in the reforestation program as this plants, sorry, as this plants are available as food for sloth bear throughout the year and it can restrict the movement of sloth bear, uh, movement of sloth bear from, from the outside the forest for food and it can be an effective tool uh, as a habitat management and conflict mitigation in the area. So this food calendar is pretty good that I've made. Now the conclusion, we have already reached the conclusion. So this study reveals the omnivorous and generalized feeding niche of sloth bear. Now the diet composition, that is the diet of uh, sloth bear, it especially consists of ants, 
dermides and fruit remnants of fruit uh, food, fruit remains then yes we also came to the conclusion that that protein rich diet is necessary or important for sloth bear and the food availability is also important to improve or enhance the ha habitat and it helps as a conflict mitigation tool so though this study is a short term study however a long term year round study with a big sample size may be required to understand the feeding biology of sloth bear yes uh, i would like to uh, thank and i'm really grateful for my guide dr nishit tharaya and my co guide dr prashi patel who have been always there throughout this dissertation and helped me through it so uh, yes uh, thank you so this was my presentation i hope most of your doubts are cleared and if you still have doubts i will try my best to uh, to solve that so i guess now the stage is yours to pitch the questions to thank you